저는 토라 포션을 12년째 이제 매일 뭐 성도들과 함께 뭐 새벽 예배에서 이렇게 나누면서 그 은혜의 자양분을 말씀의 어떤 깊숙한 곳에서 그렇게 끌어올리는 그런 기쁨들을 누릴 수가 있었습니다. 교회가 잘 버티고 또 성장할 수 있는 데에 굉장히 아주 뿌리와 같은 역할을 한것 같습니다. 코라 포션의 그 특징은 이게 지금 나의 삶과 그대로 연결되어 있다. 여기에 이런 의미가 있고 또 여기에 이런 부르심이 있고 지금 우리 삶과 또 우리 자녀들의 앞날과 연결되어 있다라고 하는 것을 이렇게 깨달으시면서 관점이 변화되는 것, 그러니까 뭐 일종의 세계관을 바꾸는 약이라고 할까요? 완전히 새로운 변화가 삶에서 일어난다라고. 절기나 또 계절이나 지금 이 시기에 주님께서 우리 가운데 이 말씀을 주시고 계시는구나 몰랐던 그런 부분들 또 전에는 감추어져 있던 그 말씀의 어떤 보석들을 찾는 그런 기쁨들을 말씀이 실제가 되고 말씀에서 우리가 나오고 우리 말씀으로 돌아가고 그런 어떤 연결들이 있는 것 같아서 재밌기도 하고 감사한 마음입니다. 이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이
the judiciary, led by then Chief Justice Aaron Barak, who, by the way, was a professor of mine at law school in America, started aggregating powers to the court. Now, it's very complicated how they've done it. They've done it in many different ways, but some examples should suffice. For example, uh, in America, this is not something the court did. This just exists. In America, we know the president, the executive branch, selects, nominates judges to the Supreme Court. Then it goes to the legislature who has to confirm them. And then finally, they sit on the court. But the court doesn't choose. Here, it's the opposite. Here, there's a committee. And because you need at least seven members of, of, of the committee of nine, and three of those members are on the court, the court always has a veto power over who sits there. So the court itself self-perpetuates a set of ideas by bringing in the people that are aligned. Combine that with a doctrine called reasonableness, which was what just passed yesterday. It was a slight tweak to that. It's no standards whatsoever. There's no constitution that tells you what's right or what's wrong. These unelected judges who self-perpetuate just can decide to nullify the acts of the democratically elected branch of the government. And that's the problem, one of many problems that are seeking to be solved by reform. Isn't this doctrine of reasonableness something that the Israeli Supreme Court essentially invented on their own? Uh, is, this, is there anything in law passed by the Knesset that would allow them to do that? Uh, you're right, Gordon. It was, it's, the word reasonableness actually exists in other countries, for example, in British law. And what Barack did as the president of the court, and he did this using many terms that appear even in our Bill of Rights and our Constitution, in some of our most storied and important uh, judicial history, they take these words, but then they use it to mean different things. So reasonableness here literally means whatever appeals to a judge or a judge. Whatever the judge believes is right, that's the standard. So there's no standard whatsoever. And again, they're unelected, which is why each side is claiming the, the mantle of pro-democracy. That's really what's going on here. They're saying it's, it's anti-democratic, meaning the pro-reformers, the anti-reformers are saying it's anti-democratic to vest too much power in the elected branches and the elect, because there's nothing that stops them. There's no constitution. The elected branches are saying, you're taking too much power, you're not even elected. And so they're trying to find a middle ground here but unfortunately, instead of simply discussing the law in a reasonable way, it's becoming a big social disruptor. Can, can you give us some examples of how the Supreme Court used reasonableness to overrule uh, the Knesset or overrule the prime minister? Sure. I mean, I'll give you an example even more egregious. There have been cases, I'm aware of at least three, where there were elected officials. I think there were mayors that were elected locally. And after they were elected, a judge decided, I think it was unreasonable for this person to be allowed to be a candidate, and therefore they're no longer the mayor. And there's no one to appeal that to. They're literally not allowing elected officials to be elected officials. This is the choice of the people. This is something, you know, we use the word court, Supreme Court, but it's a completely different beast. It's a completely different power than we're used to in America. Well, we're heading for a showdown because now the, the law that Knesset just passed yesterday saying uh, we need to rein in reasonableness, that law is now going in front of the su same Supreme Court that created the ruling in the first place. So what's your prediction of, of how this is going to turn out? Well, uh, my prediction is that it's going to be turn out to be a big political battle because you're right, 100% correct. There is no standard for reasonableness. There are already petitions to strike down the law. I don't think they've used the word reasonableness, but there are petitions to render uh, the prime minister incapacitated uh, because they don't like what he did. There is the, the same way they tried to do that, I believe, with President Trump. They used the word incapacitated in, in a different context. There are, uh, there's a petition to strike it down for being anti-democratic. Well, what does that mean? Both sides are claiming anti-democracy. In the end, it's up to the court to make its own decision based on what it wants. If there were any rationality, if there were any honesty here, the court would do what it's been doing to Netanyahu, which is say, we have to recuse ourselves. We can't make this decision by ourselves. It's highly unlikely they will do that. They have been grasping more and more power for decades. It's unlikely they'll walk away from this fight. So it will play out, unfortunately, by those who are trying to gin up a political fight in the public. Coming up, South Koreans beseeching heaven day and night for a reunified country and a look at hardships suffered by those living in North Korea.
Since the Korean War ended in 1953, North Korea has developed into one of the world's most dangerous dictatorships. In South Korea, there's a growing movement praying for the freedom of its northern neighbors. This is one of the many barriers separating North and South Korea. This barrier is to prevent North Korean infiltrators. 70 years ago, they signed an armistice dividing North and South Korea. Now, 70 years later, millions of Koreans are praying for the reunification of the country. We are praying every night for the liberation of those Korean people. And all the country members should shout together for the freedom of those Korean people. Each night for the past 17 years, from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m., intercessors like these with the Esther Prayer Movement have gathered to pray. Professor Lee says after learning of the horror in North Korea, he asked God to give him his heart for the people there. Then for a few days, I cannot eat, I cannot sleep. So many sins of North Korean, what they are happening there. The children are starved to die. So I decided until the North Korean people can freely listen to gospel, the human rights be recovered, until that point, I do every night prayer meeting continuously. But also many intercessors, we made a decision to continue every day overnight prayer meeting. Professor Lee says North Korea unfortunately leads in many of the world's worst categories. It ranks the lowest in democracy, economic freedom, and freedom of speech. It's highest in slavery, bribery, and corruption. And it's number one in Christian persecution. For decades, North Korea has been led by a personality cult of three generations, with millions in slavish devotion. They have no chance to listen to gospel, but also they have to idolize their dictator. So we should make them free in mm. their bondage. So we pray for them. He says the prison camps resemble Nazi death camps. These crude pictures show some of the horror. Guards put this small boy over a fire. And some prisoners, many of them Christian, are subjected to chemical experiments. CBN News interviewed two North Korean defectors who described what life is like inside the country, often called the Hermit Kingdom. We hid their identity for their safety and that of their family still inside North Korea. We'll call this woman A, one of the few ever to escape a prison camp. In the political prison camps, 70 percent are Christians. The crime of a Christian is espionage. What is it like in the prisons, in the concentration camps? It is so hard, too awful beyond words. In places like Yonsong prison camp, they're assigned to a forced labor and are fed watery and rotten porridge that stinks. Many people eat it and die. Places like Chongjin Prison, the cells are less than 7 to 9 square meters and up to 35 peoples are crammed into that small space. As a result, people die every day. They are also tortured. I can't express it in words. In the case of women, they're stripped, naked and raped. We interviewed B as he looked across the body of water into North Korea. In North Korea, there is no freedom at all. Even though there is no iron fence in North Korea, the whole country is like a big prison. No freedom of movement, no freedom to see, no freedom to speak, no freedom to hear, no freedom at all. Both defectors told us COVID brought a big change to the country. Many people died of starvation due to severe food crisis, and many people got sick and died without medical treatment. They prayed in the name of Jesus, and the sick were healed. When the people had high fever from COVID, they prayed in the name of Jesus and the fever went down. So the name of Jesus became very famous in North Korea. Now North Koreans who used to believe in Kim Jong-un and Kim Il-sung are now starting to say that the only one that can be trusted is Jesus. Despite the crackdown, they report the underground church has doubled since COVID to as many as 400,000. Now they spread the gospel by floating bottles filled with rice money and a USB containing the Bible and Christian videos across the water to North Korea. Professor Lee believes that wall between North and South Korea will fall, just like the Berlin Wall. I'm an economist. When I see the political economic situation, there is no answer. So delicate, so complex. So because of that, I'm more simply asked to the Lord, 
you are the perfect answer. Open your wisdom. So I perfectly rely on the Lord. He's opening the door to North Korea. So they make my heart more comfortable. So I think his perfect wisdom will open the door. And I think it's miraculously. On the 70th anniversary of the division of the Korean Peninsula, Professor Lee compares this time to when the Jews were freed from Babylon. He's asking Christians worldwide to join in praying for the people of North Korea to be free. This time to shout together, to pray together, to fast together. Then the Lord will break the war of North Korea and the authority of death over North Korea and the Lord will save North Korean people. Up next, insights from a journalist who's covered the Middle East and Israel for three decades. What she sees during these tumultuous times. Now more than ever, the eyes of the world are on the is Israel and the Middle East. Felice Friedson from the Media Line has reported tirelessly from the region, along with her husband, Michael. Their news organizations, which you can access at themedialine.org, specializes on, in unbiased coverage from the Middle East. She spoke with me in our studio recently. Take a look. Felice Friedson with the uh, Media Line. Great to see you here. We've known each other for many years. You and your husband, Michael, uh, founded Media Line back in 1999, I believe. Uh, so you've seen quite a lot here in the Middle East. Tell us your perspective of what's happening now and what's happened in the last couple of decades. Well, Chris, we do know each other a long time, and I think parallel lives in some ways. And the reality of what's happened here, much hasn't changed, sad to say. Mm -hmm. I think that you see certain developments move. If you looked at, let's say, Saudi Arabia and where they are in terms of building Neoma mega city and what's happening in terms of women there and trying to let go and let them build their own lives and trying to get away of some of the old tribal ways. Mm -hmm. You know, you look around at what's happening on the Palestinian territories next to Israel, and we know that conflict has not only not gone anywhere, it seems to have backtracked more than a decade, because I personally remember not just covering that, but ran a press club bringing Israeli and Palestinian journalists together, mm -hmm. 200 yeah. of them over years, both in Ramallah and here. And it's sort of really disheartening to see that people will use clubs to not bring people together, it's even in journalism, to talk and hold events yeah. to learn. You talked about Saudi Arabia. You have a unique perspective on sort of the Middle East after the Abraham Accords. You've been to Bahrain and the UAE and met with many of the women down there as well. Uh, tell us about that relationship. I think that the relationship is very interesting. On one hand, you have women that are coming together and trying to meet each other, and men as well, of course, mm -hmm. to build business. And a lot of it is a business deal, no matter how you look at it. I think the side or the PC side everybody talks about takes time. But that's built through relationships, no different than what I just talked about with a press club. But also there are many where, it's, where countries where it's not trickling down. And even some of the Abraham Accord countries where if government isn't stronger in terms of giving a green light to the people, to their own people and to saying to them, it's okay, we need to build these bridges, we need to change our school books, which Saudi Arabia has recently done in mm -hmm. terms of Israel, yeah. then you will see that ultimately, I think, really change the view of how things are in the Middle East. But you also have to bear in mind that the Gulf states are not the same as the greater region. You know, you're talking about Iran, you're talking about Qatar, you're talking about you know, Yemen, mm -hmm. you're talking about countries like Yemen that have huge poverty. Where I was, I was there, I, I witnessed what happens there, and we report on it on almost a daily basis. Yeah. Let's talk about journalism. Uh, last question. You teach journalism. Uh, you do journalism for, for decades now. Uh, tell us about where journalism is right now and where you hope it goes. I think that it's in a dire state. I'm sad to see what we see is journalism. We have a program with 17 universities signed for credit. Students come to our bureau in Jerusalem. We have a remote program as well. And we see students coming in and often, often not having complete understanding, particularly of this region. We help to enhance the work that they've studied. And we, what's more important is that here they're able to understand what is the story? How do I source the story? No story goes out without a minimum of two sources. Most people won't spend the time. They're more worried about clickbait. 
we have to turn around where we are. That clock has to turn back. We will never have a democracy if we don't have a free press that we remember from generations ago when journalism was created as a checks and balances on government. Mm -hmm. So that's core to everything you and I and anyone in this field is about. Well, that's a great message. And uh, Kola Gavod, great respect for, uh, for what you and Michael have done with Media Line uh, these many years. Thank you. Still ahead. Finding love and marriage is still possible, according to Eliza Ben Shalom, the Jewish matchmaker. Recently, we aired a portion of our interview with Eliza Ben Shalom from the hit Netflix show, Jewish Matchmaking. Eliza was a hit with our viewers, too. So here's more from that conversation, and you can look forward to further nuggets of wisdom from our Jewish matchmaking friend in the days to come. Do you trust what people say about themselves when they tell you, uh, you know, who they are, their background, etc.? So what's very interesting is people are usually overly critical of themselves. So they will tell you all of their faults and they will enhance that. And then they are also overly positive of all of their positive traits and who they are. So if they tell you, I love to eat healthy and exercise, that's a great statement. Now tell me, when was the last time that you exercised? And when was the last time that you ate junk? <laughs> and usually those two things are not in alignment. Eating healthy is a value, but actually doing it in my lifestyle doesn't happen as frequently as I would like it to. Yeah, here, here's another one. What are the most important things you look at to determine compatibility? We are looking at personality. We have to make sure that two people can get along and that there's a, a spark of, that's the chemistry that's gonna be between them and that's usually personality based. And then we have to look at things like, what do I want in my lifetime? What are my values? What are my goals? Where do I wanna to get to? And do, is this partner somebody who's in alignment with those things? Well, uh, personally, a, a personal question. My daughter's 31. Uh, I, I get the feeling that there are a lot of challenges for young people today that maybe not have been challenges 20, 30 years ago. Uh, what are some of the challenges that uniquely to this generation to actually uh, become, get married? One of the greatest challenges, but also I'm gonna tell you it's a blessing, is technology. So technology is here and it's available to us and for us. And when used in the right way, it's outstanding, but it also makes us realize, wow, I have so many options in so many locations. And so we tend to get frustrated and we get a little bit of what I call analysis paralysis where, eh, should I pick you? I don't know why, because maybe there's somebody better. And the truth is maybe there is somebody better, but they might be 3000 miles away and it might be difficult to get something going. So choosing your person and not having FOMO, fear of missing out on somebody else is one of our greatest challenges today. And, and there is a certain blessing in it if you can manage it properly. Yeah. Is it important to go to the right places? Definitely. It's good to go to places that are a little bit more focused, I would say marriage minded type of environments. If you go to a class or a volunteer opportunity, that's great. If you want to get married, if you want to go to a bar, you could just get a date, but you might not get a spouse. I would try to focus on things that are uh, that are bringing together people that are in a more serious moment in their lives. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Baitline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.